Hello, my name is John Tiernan. I'm the manager at Enable Ireland CTEC, one of Ireland's leading national providers of special seating services. And I'm going to talk to you today on the topic of wheelchairs and custom seating. Enable Ireland Disability Services provides services to children and adults with disabilities and their families right across the country. Our mission is to work in partnership with those who use our services to help them to achieve maximum independence, choice and inclusion in their communities. In CTEC, we work with service users to provide the best possible wheelchair, seating and positioning aids designed to meet their individual needs. So in terms of what we do, we're involved in assessment and selection of wheelchairs and special seating support systems, design and manufacture of these, and training of service users, service owners, and healthcare staff in this process. Seating is one aspect of a broader area termed postural management, and postural management refers to the control of posture over the 24 hour period. And this involves the use of positioning equipment in lying, sitting and standing, hands-on therapy, active exercise, handling techniques and education and training. And as you can see from that, seating is just one small aspect of a full 24-hour postural management program, but it is what we in CTEC are, are entirely um, focused on. So the objectives of postural management in general and seating as well specifically, are to enhance function, both physical and physiological, to prevent or minimize deformity, to provide social gain, and to help manage the seating interface pressures while doing all this. So when we talk about function, we're talking about physical function. So in therapy terms, they talk about ADLs or activities of daily living. So we're, our objective is to help people function in such a way that they we optimize their ability to undertake the activities of daily living. And that might be something such as propelling your chair or computer use or reaching or dressing or washing or food preparation or whatever the case might be. So that's the, the ADL, the physical function. But we're also very, very focused on the physiological function. And the physiological function relates to everything that occurs between your neck and your pelvis, basically. So you've got your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, your digestive system. And because all of that Sorry, um, critical activity is occurring in this region. In a seating assessment and seating prescription context, we are very focused on helping people achieve an upright, symmetric sitting posture. It's not an aesthetic thing. It's not because we like symmetry. It's because in order to function physi physiologically, function in an optimal fashion, we need to adopt an upright, symmetric sitting posture. Also, by helping to locate the pelvis in the wheelchair in the seat, it helps to maximize a person's independent reach and ability to move outside of their base of support. So we actually restrict the base of support to increase the, uh, the functional activity outside of the base of support. Our goal is also to prevent and minimize deformity. So we're looking to postural correction to help minimize the development of postural deformities. So here's a case in point of a child as they progress and grow and we can see the deterioration in their spinal scoliosis over time. At this stage here, you can see, coming back to what I mentioned in the last slide about physiological function, you can see here a huge impairment that must be there in terms of the digestive system, so the large and small intestine, the, the food being processed through the body, the lung function, this lung is compressed, this lung also is compressed because of the, the distortion of the thoracic cage or the, the rib cage, and obviously you've got a very severe and evident spinal scoliosis there, which is going to restrict the independent movement. So there's an element of inevitability sometimes to the progression of, of physical deformity, but what our objective is to help to minimize, prevent or minimize that progression. So we're looking typically at spinal correction and spinal alignment. So we're looking at a, a distorted or a scoliosed spine here, and we're applying corrective uh, supports in order to help the, the spine maintain an upright posture. Similarly, and this is broader than seating, this is coming back to the broader posture management perspective, bones are like muscles. Most people know if you don't use your muscles, they'll, they'll reabsorb or they'll waste away, they'll, they'll reduce in, in body ma in mass. The same is true for your bones. If the bones are not stressed, they won't form in the way that they're meant to. So the body has got what are, what are called osteoblasts, which reabsorb bone, and osteoclasts, which produce bone. And if the bone isn't stressed, it won't be produced in the right fashion. 
And here you can see where the hip joint should be a ball and socket joint, and there should be a, a, a sizable socket there that the, the head of the femur can go into, into the acetabulum. That is not formed because this bone area has not been receiving the stress forces that are required to trigger bone growth. So typically with, with children in, in our services, they, as part of their posture management program, they'll be put into a standing post posture to help stress the bones and joints in such a way that they will form correctly um, and that'll enable better movement uh, throughout their lifespan. This kind of segues into the, the, the final component, which is that of social gain, this concept of social gain, which is, I suppose, a tie in with the concept now of well being, personal well being. So, here again, we see standing and a standing wheelchair. And a standing wheelchair will bring with it many of the benefits of a standing frame that we saw on the previous slide. But much more importantly, potentially, is the psychosocial impact of a standing chair, bringing someone who, who cannot stand up into a standing posture so that they're looking eye to eye with, with their peers. Um, a similar social gain aspect, and I don't have a picture of it here, would be a seat riser in a power chair. So while on the face of it, it's there for functional benefit to enable someone to perhaps reach a shelf or, or reach something that they couldn't reach from their lower sitting position, Psycho psychologically, it can provide a huge boost to someone. They're in a sitting posture, but they're at eye level with people who are standing nearby. There's a raft of other benefits associated with standing chairs, which I'll touch on later in the pre presentation. Um, and I, I can take questions on that later as well, if they come up. And finally, we're seeking to manage pressure. So there is what's called a pressure map. It's a graphical representation of someone's sitting pressure when they're sitting in a, in a cushion on their wheelchair, on a cushion on their wheelchair. This first image, sorry, this first image here would be what you would expect to see, a fairly balanced, fairly even pressure distribution. In this second uh, picture, this person had a very exacerbated uh, concave lateral, left-hand side concave scoliosis, such that his right sit bone or ischial tuberosity was located on the left side of his chair, and all his pressure was concentrated through that single point, which is absolutely what we're trying to avoid in, in a seating system. I'm now going to look at the role of the pelvis in postural management. The pelvis is critically important because, as I mentioned earlier, all the important functions of the body occur between the pelvis and the head, and correct uh, anchoring of the pelvis will help optimize this physiological function that we're looking for. So what we talk about is this reference seated posture in which the head is balanced and aligned above the hips. The spine has the normal curvature, which I'll come back to. The pelvis is level or with a slight anterior pelvic tilt, which I'll touch on later. The thighs are midline or slightly abducted or apart, and the feet are rested at neutral. This concept of the spine having normal curves is illustrated here in this picture. And the normal spine curvature is this what's termed S-shaped curve of the spine. And the reason we strive for that in seating is because in a standing posture with the feet hip width apart, that's the normal anatomical shape that the spine takes up. So we're trying to replicate that in sitting, again, to optimize this physical and physiological function. The challenge is that gravity is fighting against us trying to maintain that posture. When we're standing with our feet hip width apart, our center of gravity is roughly located in our navel and roughly midway through the body. However, if we break the body down into its constituent parts and allocate a center of gravity to each of those constituent parts, when the person moves from standing into sitting, the center of gravity of the entire body, because of the change of the individual centers of gravities, the center of gravity of the entire body moves approximately an inch in front of the navel, meaning that if the person were to relax fully there, their center of gravity is in front of their body and their body will collapse forward. So for this reason, it requires constant firing of the muscles to help maintain this upright sitting posture. And the challenge with that is that the pelvis is effectively an upside down pyramidal shape. So it's dynamically unstable. So this is an illustration of the pelvis with what's called a neutral pelvis, where the anterior superior iliac spine, the ASIS, is level with the posterior superior iliac spine, which runs fr from one side of the iliac crest to the other side of the iliac crest. So in a neutral pelvis, the ASIS, ASIS and PSIS are level and the spine will have this normal curvature that was illustrated above. However, it takes energy and effort to maintain that posture. Our tendency is to slump backwards or to extend forwards. 
And maintaining that posture takes muscle balance and energy. So the tendency then is to adopt very often a posterior pelvic tilt where the AS is highest, higher than the PSIS. When we adopt a posterior pelvic tilt, this kind of invokes a spinal kyphosis. And the disadvantage of a spinal kyphosis is that you get rather than you get a C-shaped curve in the spine, and instead of a distributed pressure, you get a point loading at certain points in the spine and the sacrum and the ischial tuberosities down here. And the challenge with this is these are all areas of very thin layers of tissue. So they're areas that are prone to tissue breakdown, tissue injury, pressure injury. With an anterior pelvic tilt, it's the opposite scenario. The PASIS, excuse me, is lower than the PSIS. And the desire for upright balance causes an increased lumbar lordosis. That's an exacerbated extension of spinal extension or extension of the spine. And the challenge with both these postures, posterior pelvic tilt and anterior pelvic tilt, is they limit function. Another thing that we come across is what's termed pelvic obliquity, where one side is lower than the other side. And the challenge with that is that there's very limited range of movement between each of the vertebrae in the spine. So if the pelvis is offline, typically the head is aligned with the horizon because we have this writing reflex in our, in our head. And then as a result of that, you get this compensatory scoliosis and over time that can become fixed. So our objective is to try and correct that lateral lean and help people maintain an upright sitting posture. And we do that typically by applying what are termed lateral trunk supports to the torso. And at the same time, helping to lock the pelvis in a neutral posture by applying lateral thigh support, hip supports down here and a pelvic positioning belt across the thighs as well. With pelvic rotation, which typically accompanies a pelvic obliquity, one ASIS is further forward than the other. And we try to correct this by using what's called an anterior pelvic support or a four point hip strap. And that hip strap is applied across the front of the pelvis rather than over the thighs. And that applies a corrective force here, sub ASIS, so below the ASIS on the pelvis. And that helps to correct the pelvic posture and again, you move from a point force to a distributed pressure, which I'll touch on shortly. You might also need to, in this image here, you'll see this hip is what's called adducted. And because it's adducted or moving towards the center relative to the pelvis, the head of the femur here is at risk of dislocation. So having corrected the pelvis, we then look at correcting the femur at the knee by applying an abductive force, so a force that pushes the thigh out towards the side. And we might need to apply an adductive force to do the opposite on the other thigh at the knee. Now I'd like to focus on the topic of pressure management and pressure injury. A pressure injury is defined as a localized area of tissue degeneration in the skin and or underlying tissue. Why does it occur? It occurs because healthy skin requires good supply of blood, good supply of oxygen, good supply of nutrients, and effective removal of waste products. So at a biological level, cells can be considered as being like little power plants. And if you think of what fuels a power plant or fuels a fire in your stove, you need something to bring the fuel, that's the blood supply in the case of the cells. You need oxygen to burn and you need fuel to burn. If you don't have fuel and oxygen, you don't have a fire. If you don't have fuel, nutrients, and oxygen in your cells, you don't get energy. So your cells need oxygen and nutrients to produce the energy. They need the blood flow to bring them there. And having produced the en energy, just like the ash in your fire at home, they need the blood to take the waste products away. So anything that impinges on the blood supply or impacts on the supply of oxygen or nutrients or removal of waste products will predispose someone to pressure injury. So insufficient blood supply, insufficient supply of oxygen, insufficient supply of nutrients, or ineffective removal of waste products will cause tissue damage. Another, and historically it was well understood, or it's been reasonably well understood, that if you compress the, 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 uh, the blood vessels, that will reduce or impact the blood supply. What's only becoming understood more thoroughly in more recent times is the impact of shear forces on tissue damage. 
So direct pressure is quite obvious. That's a direct pressure that you can imagine if you press down in your tissue. And then friction also is, is a contributing factor. So that's friction. But shear is kind of more subtle and, and, and more insidious in that as I go like this, that's static. That's not actually moving. But the tissue in my forearm here is under shear force. It's, ex it's experiencing a shear strain as a result of the shear force. So a shear strain is a distortion of the tissue caused by a force and creating this opposite but parallel sliding motion in the tissue. And I'll illustrate this better in the next slide. So here's compression, direct compression as illustrated by, by direct normal force on the tissue. If it's compressed, you can see there the cells get squashed. So they get wider, fatter if you like, and, and squashed in the downwards direction. And you can imagine that pinching off the blood flow like if you pinch a straw. However, more damaging than that is the shear. And the shear has this impact of causing the tissues to kind of, or the, the individual cells to kind of tear apart. And even under direct, static direct pressure, the, the direct pressure is only directly under my finger. In the zone all around my finger, there's a static shear distortion happening. And that is contributing to, to uh, tissue damage and pressure injury. And another way to illustrate this point is if we are to look at the pressure readings taken across a cross section of a person sitting across their, their, their bottom at the points of their ischial tuberosities. So where there's no contact with the seat, there's no pressure. And out here at the edge of the buttocks, there's a slight bit of pressure as it starts to, the, the contact, sorry, the contact with the seat's cushion starts to increase. As we get towards the center of the buttock and towards what are called the ischial tuberosities or the sit bones, the pressure reaches a peak, then it reduces, come back moves, it reduces, it increases and reduces, tapers off again as we get towards the edge of the seat cushion. I hope that's clear to everybody. It's easier in a classroom situation to describe this. But what's interesting about this slide is not so much the, the peak pressure, what this would be called the peak pressure, but the slope of the curve or the rate of change of pressure from one point to the next. So the rate of change of pressure shows that the, the difference in pressure from one cell to an adjacent cell, and that is the shear uh, torsion, that's the, the, the shear um, strain that's happening in the tissues. And what this graph illustrates is that if you pick up your, your knee and cross your legs, you can effectively offload the pressure on the vesicle tuberosity on one side, but you end up doubling the pressure on the other side. And not only do you double the pressure, See how the slope of the graph has changed from this to this? You're massively increasing the shear strain in the tissues. So the example of someone sitting with their legs crossed, they're increasing massively the pressure on one side, and they're also increasing the shear strain and predisposing themselves to pressure injury. So sitting with your legs crossed effectively is a big no-no uh, if you're at risk of uh, pressure injury. But this is more about illustrating the impact of pressure and shear. I'm now just going to I'm now just going to do a whistle stop tour of wheelchairs because I know the uh, following presentation is going to deal with this in much more detail. Just a little bit of by way of history uh, through to the early 20th century, um, the bath wheelchair would have been uh, the, the mobile chair, if you like, and as you can see, here, fairly crude timber armchair with an axle bolted to it and wheels attached and a, a turning wheel at the back. So that would have been the standard, if you like, wheelchair up until around 1932, when a couple term called Everest and Jennings collaborated to design what's now considered the general standard wheelchair, the Everest and Jennings folding steel frame wheelchair. So that particular design dates back to 1932, and it's still in common use today. And that is what, when most people think of wheelchair, typically that is what they see in their mind's eye. And here are two examples of modern day equivalents, the Van Os XL, which is a, a contract wheelchair, HSC contract wheelchair, and the JB Mobility Rotor Speed One. Very similar chairs in terms of appearance, but quite different in terms of material choice and specification and cost. A tilt and space chair, is a chair something similar to those, but in which it's possible to tilt the person's body in space. And that for the, the kind of the analogy that I try to use to describe the benefit of that 
It doesn't really redistribute pressure. You need to be tilted to about 45 degrees to experience pressure distribution. But what it does is it draws the body's center of gravity back in towards the base of support. And it's a bit like kicking back on a sofa and putting your feet up um, under different, different circumstances. So it just gives, for someone who isn't able to independently change their body position in space, it gives them that opportunity and allows for, for relief throughout the day. Uh, these are termed rigid lightweight manual wheelchairs or active user wheelchairs. And again, two very similar designs here. A very subtle difference. <clears throat> Sorry, first of all, the difference primarily between a rigid frame and a folding frame chair is that rigid frames, by virtue of their rigidity, are more efficient. As you propel the rigid frame chair, you're not losing energy, propulsive energy, through distortion of the frame. The frame is rigid. So as you propel, you get that energy through to the wheels. However, the disadvantage of them, or one disadvantage of them, is that they tend to give a rougher ride. There's an inherent uh, uh, suspension in the fact that the folding frame chair will distort a little bit while it's moving across ground. With these, that won't happen. So it's a bit like sports suspension in a car versus uh, comfort suspension. Um, the other major benefit of these chairs typically is their weight. And you can get a, a carbon fiber rigid frame chair now down to around two kilogram weight plus two kilograms for each of the wheels. And um, these examples here on this slide are weigh about four kilos each. And as subtlety, the reason I put these two on is this one here is a subframe. This one here doesn't. I don't know what the industry term is. I term these a boomerang frame uh, because the, the frame is kind of boomerang like. But in my own experience, a service user was trying to transfer into their car and lift this one across themselves into the passenger seat, having popped off the wheels. They couldn't do that because of the subframe. They were able to do it with this chair. So very similar chairs, but subtle differences can have a huge impact. And I touched on this earlier. I'm not going to dwell on it now, other than to say it's something that can be Googled and you find the information on it. But just to highlight the fact that standing wheelchairs carry with them a, a raft of benefits. I, I, um, that being said, they because by virtue of the fact that they have the standing mechanism in them, they are much heavier than regular lightweight rigid manual wheelchairs. So I be very surprised if someone had a standing chair as their primary chair would typically be an investment, a second chair that somebody might have in addition to their daily chair. From our perspective, from CTEC, we are involved in the assessment of the physical, functional and environmental requirements of people who attend our service with a view to helping them select the most appropriate wheelchair to their needs and then designing the most appropriate seating supports around that wheelchair. So from our perspective, it's irrelevant what wheelchair a person has, we will design the seating into whatever chair they have. But we also do provide that advisory service. We, we're not affiliated to any of the commercial companies, so we can provide a fully independent and objective assessment service uh, for both wheelchair and seating requirements. I'm now going to talk about CTEC custom manufacture because that is effectively what we are about. That is what our department specializes in. And our mantra is we make what cannot be bought. So if it can be bought off the shelf, if it comes in a box from another supplier, we are not trying to make, remake uh, um, the same thing. We are manufacturing specific bespoke one-off solutions for people with complex requirements. So I'm going to present a few examples of these now. And this is a case in point of a service user where we custom made their seating system. But what's of note in this particular case is this person's knee contractures. So this foot was not able to extend, this knee was not able to extend to the normal, what we considered a normal 90, 80 or 70 degree sitting posture. So what we had to do here was literally flip around the foot support. So ordinarily these foot supports would start around about here and extend out to about here, but we swapped them over. So he has his right on the left and the left is on the right and we padded them up. We also had to do an undercut on the seat cushion, excuse me, again to accommodate the, the lower leg coming back in under the seat. And we also had to make sure that the foot supports here didn't clash with the casters as the chair turns, that it allowed the casters to rotate underneath. Another case in point here is again a bespoke seating system. So we manufactured the full seating system here comprising custom seat, custom back lateral trunk supports, a medial knee support or pommel, and additional padding on the arm supports for, for pressure management. But that's kind of our, our, our run of the mill stuff. What's unique about this particular job is we took a commercial product here, this swing away device, which is intended to mount a joystick or anything uh, to the chair. Um, but we needed to get this joystick midline. So we custom, there you can see a cut where that's been cut and welded, relatively straightforward process, but again, something that you need specialist equipment to do. So it's been cut and welded to bring the joystick midline. 
and our technicians also manufactured this little these wrist supports so the person can rest their hands and there's a rest there while they control the joystick in their power chair so again very very bespoke seating both seating solution and then access wheelchair access solution for this individual something similar on the next slide uh wheelchair user here who's actually ambulant she can walk small short distances however she needed a fairly basic power chair for longer distances for shopping and excursions and things like that but with her shortened limbs she wasn't able to reach the joystick which would ordinarily be located here so a little bit similar to the last job this was literally just a case of cutting and welding and it's a bit blurry but you can see there we've taken where the joystick would normally come we've brought it medially or inboard and raised it up so that she can now access the control system and drive the wheelchair independently again a very basic modification here this is for a child in a in a attending a conventional school we've taken in a chair from the school the uh, legs have been extended so raised to, to raise the chair up from the ground because the person is taller than the chair permits and the person has a leg length discrepancy um, so one leg is shorter than the other it could be to do with an inability to flex the right thigh hip um, or it could be that the right hip is dislocated slightly um, uh, but I doubt it because the left hip here uh, is flexing to 90 and needs the additional support so I, I imagine um, there's a there's a limited uh, flexibility in the right hand side hip Here's another case in point, more about lateral thinking and, and custom modification rather than custom manufacture. Here, somebody came in, we had manufactured their seating system for them. They came in for a review, and this was the pressure that they were experiencing. That's the ASIS, the anterior superior leg spine that we were talking about earlier, so the front of the pelvis. And we were really at a loss as to what to do here. I didn't know where I was going to go with it, but we had a try. And what we did was we took a chest, this is typically a chest harness. So not a hip strap, but a chest harness, but we applied it as a hip strap. And we did that because it was so broad, we were distributing the pressure. And in, in addition to that, what we did was we actually fitted a Rojo, what's called a Rojo adapter pad, which is a little pad of bubbles of air. And we fitted that in underneath. So with the Rojo adapter pad, the chest harness, and then the pelvic strap over the chest harness. So uh, this is the strap you see here. So here it is again, but positioned over the chest harness. This scenario, which was heading towards very serious skin breakdown, didn't uh, result in tissue injury and actually got better even though there was still pressure being applied to it but it was being applied in a in a way that the body could tolerate i'm going to talk a little bit now about what's termed custom contoured seating because again two reasons one this is our speciality and two it's actually advancing in a very interesting way at the moment but custom contoured seating is seating that is manufactured based on an impression that is taken of a person's individual body shape so rather than measuring and cutting uh, components to size to match someone we actually sit the person in a vacuum bead bag and correct their posture as best we can and when we've done that we use the bead bag we suck out the air from the bead bag and we're left with the person's body shape that shape capture is then used to produce the seat which is then completed and provided to the person so the current state-of-the-art approach to doing this is called cnc foam carving so we sit the person in the mold we suck out the air, capture the body shape. We then use a light scanner to do a three-dimensional digital scan of their body shape as caught in the impression in the mold. We then use computer or CAD CAM, computer-aided manufacture, to convert that digitized file into a carved foam cushion based on their body shape. And there's an example of a cushion being carved by a robotic carver. So that is the current industry standard. Um, it provides a very intimate contour that matches the person's body exactly. However, there are several limitations to it. First of all, it's very wasteful of material. You're converting about half a block of foam into foam dust, which has no use. It's very expensive. Uh, the capital cost is, is very high for these robotic carvers. And there's an environmental impact of the foam dust. But more importantly, really, for the service user, the end user of the product, foam is an insulator so if you want to heat your house you wrap it in foam if you want to heat your attic you insulate it with foam so foam is an insulator so we're effectively wrapping the person's body in this insulative material which has the impact of building up heat and heat can build up moisture and sweating and that increases a person's risk of injury and tissue breakdown so we're trying to investigate alternative means uh, to doing this at the moment and we've been undertaking a project for the last four years looking at the potential of 3d printing 
custom contract for interceding systems. And we're just coming to the end of that project. We're about to start some trials with 3D printed cushions. This is a matrix exploring the different methods of custom contract seating manufacture and seeing how 3D printing should offer benefits relative to the others. And that's something that we're exploring at the moment. So the additive manufacturing process or 3D printing process would be the same in that you capture the person's shape, you digitize it, you post-process it, and you, but this time you produce a 3D printed system. When we started the project back in 2017, there were small components being 3D printed and we 3D printed this quarter size uh, prototype cushion. At that point in time, it was going to take 500 hours to print a full scale cushion. But over the course of the project, that has now come down to approximately five, between four and five hours to print a cushion. So we printed what I understand to be the world's first concept prototype, 3D printed custom contoured feature cushion. That was done uh, at the end of 2019. And we spent 2020, 2021 trying to optimize that design. And we're looking at print patterns that will minimize the amount of material used, optimize airflow, and minimize the weight of the cushion. So we're just coming to the end of phase one of that project at the moment. So it's an exciting time for us. And I just wanted to share that with you. Finally, I've been asked to speak a little bit on the topic of transport safety. The best resource in relation to this topic is what's termed the International Best Practice Guidelines on the Transportation of People Seated in Wheelchairs. So if anybody is interested in finding out more about any aspect relating to the next few slides or the topic of safe transportation of occupied wheelchairs, that would be the reference point that I, I, I direct you to. But in its simplest form, what people need to know about transporting in a wheelchair, well, in the first instance is if at all possible, if possible, you are safer to transfer out of your wheelchair and into a vehicle seat if that can be done safely. A vehicle seat is intended, number one, to be comfortable, but number two, to protect you in the event of a vehicle impact, vehicle collision. That is the single and sole purpose of a vehicle seat. And it's pretty much a direct uh, conflict with a wheelchair seat whose purpose is to move you around. So a vehicle seat's intention is to be static and protect you. A wheelchair's purpose is to move you around the place. So if at all possible, it's preferable to move into the vehicle seat. If you can't, then the important thing is to, that the wheelchair seat would behave like a vehicle seat. And the industry standard for this now at this point in time is what's called a WTORS, a wheelchair tie down and occupant restraint system. A wheelchair tie down system typically comprises four tie down points, two at the front and two at the back, tying the wheelchair to the vehicle floor. And in addition to that, then you have the occupant restraint system, which is the same as a seat belt or an occupant restraint in a normal vehicle seat. It's critically important to understand that an occupant restraint system is not the same as the seat belt on your wheelchair. What's referred to as the seat belt on your wheelchair is typically just a safety belt for regular use or a postural corrective belt if it's a postural positioning belt for postural support purposes. But the seat belt that comes in your chair or the postural support strap that comes in your chair is not suitable for use as a safety belt or an occupant restraint in a vehicle. You need a separate occupant restraint system that's been crash tested. It's important that the tie down location is located symmetrically across the wheelchair. So the wheelchair is intended to be secured as illustrated in these two images and no other way. This is a case in point of a vehicle that was presented to me recently from a service user where the front tie downs are fine. They're located symmetrically around the midpoint of the wheelchair. However, the rear tie down points, this one is kind of all right. This one is right in the middle of the wheelchair, completely inappropriate. That tie down point, so if I can just highlight those points, this fourth one here should be located here as a minimum. Ideally, both of these rear points a bit further out. So this is a completely inappropriate configuration of a vehicle that was done by a professional vehicle conversion company in the last year. So the next slide I'm showing you not to confuse or to, to make it look complicated, but actually to simplify it. The vehicle conversion companies have access to these international standards, which direct the location of the wheelchair tie down knockment restraint points. So it's not expected that the, the lay person would have this information, but it is expected that the vehicle conversion company would have the, the information to hand and would understand where the appropriate tie down points would be, such that the wheelchair can be located and secured in this fashion. 
So as an audience, what I'm asking you to take away from today is that if you're being transported in a vehicle, you should be symmetrically secured by front and rear wheelchair tie downs, and you should have a separate occupant restraint system. There are, in addition, docking systems which can be designed for specific wheelchairs. So these would be one off for individual users where a locking latch system can be attached to the wheelchair and you can drive up and into the car and it can be automatically locked in position. So that will address the four point tie down scenario that I've described, but it won't address the occupant restraint system. You will still need an occupant restraint. And the design of an occupant restraint for a wheelchair user is exactly the same as the design of an occupant restraint for a regular vehicle occupant. It's intended to load the bony prominences of the bony parts of the body. So the pelvic support strap here should go sub ASIS. We talked about the ASIS at the top of the pelvis. It should go just below the top of the pelvis. And the chest component should catch you in the mid clavicle, re the mid scapular, re the mid sternal region here. This is your sternum. And the chest strap should cross the sternum and cross the clavicle here. So all the straps should cross bony components of your body. They should not be here in the soft tissue injury, in the so soft tissue area, because that will cause a soft tissue injury if you're in an accident. And finally, head supports. These cause a lot of confusion and a lot of questions. A head support is a postural support device, and this is cited in the best practice guidelines. It is, its primary purpose is to provide postural support to your head. Its primary purpose is not to act as a head restraint. However, it has been shown that a head, an appropriately positioned head support can offer the benefit of a head restraint if someone is in a rear, low speed rear vehicle impact. A low speed rear vehicle impact. It does nothing for you in a frontal impact. It is there, it will help, might help to prevent against a whiplash injury if the vehicle in which you're traveling is struck from behind. But it is critically important that the head restraint, head support, is positioned as close as possible to the back of the head, so more, no more than about a half an inch from the back of the head, and at the appropriate height, as illustrated here. So there is no guarantee that a head support on your wheelchair will act as a head restraint in a car. It is not guaranteed, but there is evidence to suggest that it will offer some benefit. So it is strongly recommended that if you're traveling in a vehicle in your wheelchair, that you have a head support fitted with the idea or with the intention of it offering some head restraint if the vehicle is struck from behind. So that's it from me uh, and thank you very much for your attention, thank you for listening and if there are any questions they'll be dealt with in the question and answer session.